Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming up. Had a bit technical issues to start the day, but it was all while you weren't here, so nothing happened. It's all going great so far. Um, so party like it's ANSI 99. But first, I used to work at an investment bank. I'm sorry. Um, and, but it wasn't this type of stuff. It was closer to that type of stuff. But specifically and exactly, you know, every once in a while, my manager was out so I could, uh, you know, relax a bit. Hi, I'm Huss. I'm the CTO and co-founder of a startup called Ninefin. Uh, we're about 18 months old, and we use uh, computer vision and machine learning to automate the extraction of financial data from documents. Uh, before that, as I mentioned, worked in investment banking in the technology department in the equity trading team. So doing all kinds of stuff with e equities trading technology, um, bespoke trader tools, and uh, risk and control systems. And background before that was aeronautical engineering, so a lot of stuff about airplanes. Uh, visa, the slides should be up, uh, I guess, once we're done with the day, but that's where you can find them on my Speaky Deck page. But we're not here to talk about any of that today. Let's talk about ANSI 1999. Um, party, this is, this is going to be fun. Sequel's always fun for me, I hope it's fun for you. Um, ANSI stands for the American National Standards Institute. It's a bit of a dated term, because now they go by the term uh, SQL colon a year. So we're currently on SQL 2016. That's the current live standard of her language. But 999 makes a better pun, and I like puns. So uh, brace yourselves. Um, there was supposed to be two more puns in here, but the content didn't quite match up with what I was uh, speaking about. And that's fine, because you probably don't want me up here pontificating uh, too much about, uh, about uh, what I'll be talking about. A anyone catch that one? This is you, you only have yourselves to blame. So let's talk about databases, um, and specifically relational database systems. And they have a long, long history. Um, uh, so let's chart the timelines of three of probably the most popular um, databases in terms of installation base, uh, apart from one notable omission. Um, first, let's follow PostgreSQL or Postgres uh, started out as Berkeley Ingress in, 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 in the 1970s. A lot of them actually traced their roots back to that university at that particular time. Uh, and then through a series of quite regular updates, you know, Postgres has been uh, iteratively improved upon from all that time up to Postgres 11 got released in beta, I think, last week. Um, my, uh, Microsoft SQL Server actually started out life as Sybase, and then due to a fork happening in about the early 90s, it eventually found its way into becoming uh, a product that's now associated with Microsoft, and the massively used MySQL uh, started off as uh, MSQL in, uh, in the 1990s. And I'm highlighting there uh, PEP248, uh, DB uh, API version 1.0, was uh, first kind of released. That was 1996. And that was only a few years after Python, the language, first also got released. So databases and Python go back a long, long way. But what's going to help us understand even more? Let's do some software archaeology to kind of understand where we're coming from. Um, BigCo EE, EE stands for Enterprise Edition. Um, siloed groups with, uh, with, with big databases. I see a lot of people. Um, probably recognizing this image of architecture um, from large institutions. Um, technology functions are kind of split for each system, and the databases are really the system of record and the final destination for all the data uh, that's produced by one particular team and, and uh, one particular department. And to get data across, it's normally an extraction job or to shift stuff around, the files being transferred. Um, and you ended up being in specific, you ended up having specific SQL developers that were doing SQL as their, primary, as their primary application language. So programming stuff in the database using things like store procedures, or you might hear them, call, you might hear them be called functions. Uh, and there was also this very special role known as the, the database administrator. I'm not sure if they actually exist, or if they're real or not, but they do amazing things with, uh, they do amazing things with keeping these databases alive and healthy. I sat next to uh, one during one of my graduate placements in my time when I, when I was in the bank, and that's probably where I learned a lot of the stuff I'm doing now. So what did that lead to? That led to an architecture called the fat client, in which 
the UI application spoke directly to the database. Uh, we had a new engineer join my team recently and he kind of struggled to kind of grasp the concept of like, no, the UI has an open database connection to the database. There's nothing in between and your roles and permissions are the database's roles and permissions and if the database is down, the application's down. Um, but, that, but that pattern wasn't just present in kind of these enterprise situations. Um, even in the early days of the webs and even into like the mid to early 2000s, uh, things like Apache servers were kind of doing everything all in one place. So you had your Apache serving the web uh, traffic, then you had uh, something like hot PHP, and then that was talking to a uh, MySQL instance. It was all done on one, on one, on one place. Then we kind of moved to what's the three-tier architecture and now the extension of it in mesh networks and microservices and that's where we basically put something in between the end destination of the client and the data store layer. And uh, this can be a server, a cache, or a proxy or some, some other client. Typically the endpoints uh, on an enterprise messaging bus if you're in the enterprise or if you're in the web, just a HTTP. Um, HTTP brokered protocols, and this decoupled her data storage layer from that application layer, uh, from the application layer, and that was really important because this then kind of allowed the two streams to kind of develop at their own pace, and this led to the explosion in all these web uh, tools and technologies. And you know, I'm obviously showing some of the more modern Python web frameworks, but uh, as Naomi mentioned downstairs, you know, um, these Python has always been involved in web frameworks. Um, so that's great. Now let's talk about state and the problem of state. Now application code has been in source control for a long, long time. We've, we have won the battle against getting people to use source control. Maybe it's still waging on in parts of academia, but source control is the standard and everyone's very comfortable with it. Everyone knows how to use it, uh, be it you know, Git, Subversion, Mercurial, whatever your flavor. And that's helped by the fact that application code itself is, or uh, let's call it uh, application code such as Java or, or Python or any application language, so, so to speak, is stateless in the sense that data just transiently passes through it. It doesn't reside in it. Uh, and that means that you can kind of arbitrarily go backwards and forwards in time, traversing your tree of history to kind of get back to a known state which you it might not necessarily be working, but at least you know what it is. Coming to, uh, and there's also just amazing tooling and support for that type of development uh, environment. You come to databases, I think, in my view, it's still an unsolved problem. How, how, how do we bring source control or the concepts of source control into the world of databases? Because the databases hold the data as well, uh, hold the code as well as the data. Um, and the data is resident in that database and points in time are actually tied to the particular state of the data at any one point. So trying to go backwards and forwards, you need to do it in a way that is ineffected by the data or once you pass a certain point, you can no longer go backwards in time and that's a bit of a problem. There are some good tools for managing the structure of the data. So the metadata that describes the structure of the database, but I think we're still trying to find our way into figuring out how to uh, do that for the data inside it. So where does that leave us? Is it just best to assume nothing of a database and just treat it as a dump container? Data in, data out. Well, it depends. And actually that's been the approach for a long time and it's served us very well. That's what we've been doing. Um, SQL and, and applications today, um, we make use of a lot of uh, object relational mappers. So those are tools, uh, if anyone's used Django, you'll have heard of uh, the Django RM, um, but there are other ones as well, like, uh, like SQL Alchemy is probably the most well known. Uh, and the basic structure is you have your models and you talk to the ORM backend and it takes care of going to the database driver to do your communication for you. And that's actually quite a good pattern for this whole wave of web-based technologies because you normally want to model something happening, you know, a user doing a process, putting something in a checkout basket. Can they do that? Can they not? You do really, you really are dealing in objects and relations and you are genuinely making any, a mapping to them. But SQL and applications today, can we do more? You know, 
these are very high performance machines, especially now, you know, now that they kind of got over a hump of kind of being in the shadows for a bit. You know, these are normally written in low level programming languages like C or C++. It'd be shame, you know, not to, not to make use of what they can do. So we can work with JSON types, we can work with XML. You can also do things like, if you can do more stuff in the database, then you can do your computation where the data actually resides. Uh, that's great. Uh, but also, it also saves you network traffic. In the days of so, in you know, in these days where we're just hoarding and using so much data in our modern web technology stacks, or even any technology stack, that number does add up. Um, and you can, I think, the killer feature of all relational databases is that you can guarantee and enforce the constraints of your business logic in that database, and it can never go wrong. And it has saved me a number of times. Uh, from some things that I did that weren't that best advised. So how can we use all of this in a simple and easy way from our Python code? How do we solve, and how do we solve the source control problem at the same time? So let's take a look, let's quickly take an aside. This is a, a snippet of a JSON from a Pokemon a API. It's quite fun if you want to use it, actually. So this is uh, an entry for Pikachu. And uh, with something like Postgres and most of the other databases do also imp do also implement these, uh, uh, these access methods as well, but they're not quite the same syntax. So I can directly go into the JSON, which is stored in a row, in a column, and I can get the attributes and I can unpack them and then I can extract a particular sub-object. So that's the type of stuff that we're able to do. So no longer bringing something in as a dictionary and then doing dot keys, dot items, and then tra traversing stuff hundreds of thousands of times. So, at this point, I want to introduce you to SQLPy. It's an open source library which I've been working on for maybe a year now. Uh, you write SQL next to your application code. And it does kind of break the paradigm of having something that isn't Python next to your Python, but it's separate. It isn't mixed in with your Python, and that's basically the idea behind it. We had to, something had to give somewhere. Uh, and what it does for you, it prepares a func tool, a func tools partial for you. And uh, so that you don't have to have your query strings randomly dotted around all of your code. At least it can be in one place. It's very lightweight. It doesn't make any, uh, it doesn't ask any questions of you. It just tries to uh, get out your way and let you logically organize your query strings rather than try and uh, tell you how they should be executed or that kind of thing. And the idea is not new. Uh, the kind of concept uh, uh, came from a library called YeSQL, which is written in Clojure, um, also by a fellow Londoner open source enthusiast. So do go check that out as well. And there are lots of ports, uh, lots of ports for other libraries as well. And it's in source control. Your queries can be in source control now. And why do we need this? Because that awkward moment when you need SQL. So this is a, I have picked an example to be, to look quite hard, but this is a subquery using something like SQL Alchemy. And what it is, you need to define two objects, one that defines the inner object and the outer query, and then you need to join them together. And this actually is like, Pythonic is quite nice to read, it's fine. Uh, but the semantics are kind of leaking a bit between each other. So at the bottom of the subquery, um, the order by and the group by, now if any of you know SQL, those are optional uh, words. But the fact that the dot of the order by is after the group by, does that mean that you can't use order by unless there's a group by? That's not really, so it is leaking slightly, but it's not the worst you know, uh, accusation of it. Um, so, but that's just where we're starting to um, hit these barriers of when maybe we need to turn to using SQL strings ourselves directly. How would you do the same thing in SQL? It's that top one there, just a few lines. Um, but also, this one's quite funny because it is actually quite easy to do it just in Python, just with iter tools. So this is a case where these complex data access methods are hard in things like object relational mappers, but are easy in, in either SQL or in just plain Python. So there's a choice either way. Uh, if you still like to tie things to models, then you can basically freely make your own models. So you can use a serializer like Marshmallow and basically you just, um, if any of you have worked with Java or C++, uh, the data access object pattern in which you define your object and then you basically encapsulate all of the things that go and get things in and out of the database in that object. Uh, Enterprise Bean as well, you know, I don't want to give too many people bad, bad memories. But uh, uh, that's kind of, uh, that, 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 that kind of stuff is totally in your hands as well. 
uh, SQL pine composition. This is basically the thing which I only need, I only realized I wanted about six months after making the first version. So the first version of SQL Py, you can only just do a query string as it was. You couldn't make and assemble uh, different versions of the query depending on what you are doing it. And quite rightly so, it is quite a hard thing to do and it's quite a dangerous thing to do. You don't want to be passing strings into your, uh, into your DB2 API without you know, checking that everything is fine. So the solution to it was something I call built SQL in which the clauses are, are added depending on the data which you pass to it. So if there are certain keywords present, it knows how to construct it so that your ands are all in place. So for example, select star from where, uh, and, 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 and it will only make those ands uh, when it has the right data. But importantly, it still passes through your particular library of choice to make sure it's all safe and, and at, at the end of the day. So how does that look? This is an example table. So on the top is the query that you'd see in your queries file that's kind of in your, in your host, host code. You can recognize the placeholders there um, in keyword argument form. Then you would just pass in args as a dictionary and it would know what, what to assemble at the end of the day. And beyond the web apps, so Python is taking over. So um, there's a multitude of tools that have made Python the interface language of choice for so many things, but the glue to hold things together has been bash scripts, which I'm learning more and more about every day. I mean, it's quite an amazing tool, uh, or Python scripts. Uh, but why not use Python all the way through our systems since you know, we're, we're, we're all here and we all, enjoy, and we all enjoy making use of Python. Can we make use of it uh, more thoroughly in our applications and in our, in, in our systems? So just show of hands, who here uses Python in a data science context? And that number are quite a lot of people. So even if you haven't been convinced by what I'm saying, I still like my files, or I still like my ORM, it doesn't matter because you don't have a choice. Let me explain why. Moving data from A to B is kind of a very frequent task and data cleaning is, and transformation is something that we probably spend too much of our time doing that we love to hate. And object relational mappers are sometimes not very useful in that sense because you're not really doing entities. We're kind of on the fly taking things out in the attributes. We don't want to have to go make a new CSV file every time and stick it in. It's, to get, it's kind of a whole palaver. So something like SQL Py can help uh, in that because you, you can put it in your Python code where you're actually doing your experiments and you can run it from an IPython, you can do whatever you like of it because um, all it really is is just assembling your queries and at least you know where they are, but they're all in one place. So why did I say you, you have no choice? Because all of these modern new kind of cloud native data stores have all decided that SQL or SQL-like variants are gonna be their language of choice for allowing you to describe the interface as to how to get to, uh, as to how to get to uh, access parts of that. So just the, uh, they're not implementing the full SQL standard, but they're implementing quite a lot of it. So your selects are there, your, your, your froms and your wares are all there. And just a few examples, uh, Kafka has KSQL, Spark has Spark SQL, BigQuery has, uh, well, it's BigQuery, and even AWS has something for using SQL to search what essentially uh, file objects. So that's, so that's pretty cool. So my last slide, I'm just going to see how we can use SQL Py to also uh, play with these. So since SQL Py has no opinion as to the backend or the data store which you are using, um, it just expects something which kind of has the methods defined in the DB2 API on the cursor. Um, so stuff like execute, fetch one, fetch all. Uh, so let's take a look if this will work and let me transfer out. All right, cool. So I have to do it from screen. So what I have here, page up. Let me just zoom in so you can see it. How's that? Better? Cool, so let's take a look at, so what, what I've done, I've done a very quick, uh, basically I followed the tutorial from Google Cloud on, on BigQuery, and this is, they have an open data set of Stack Overflow questions. And basically this, you can see what I was getting at by having SQL strings inside your code. So this is Python code with quite a significant proportion of it taken up by things that are strings. And uh, it's fine to read, but imagine if that file suddenly became really, really long. So all I'm doing, I'm just importing the BigQuery uh, library. I'm just making my query as a string. I'm initiating the client. Uh, I'm, I'm running it. And 
I'm printing it. So let's go over to Avatar and see what it looks like. So I need to run. Uh, no SQL pi. So all that's going to do is just going to print out the top questions that had the tag Python in them. So that's what that looks like. So if I switch back quickly to the other tab, page down, doo -doo -doo, and show you what is in the other file, which is run SQL pi, much neater. And all I've done at the top is I've just kind of just defined a mock cursor object. Um, this idea only came to me the other day, so I'm kind of, uh, it's there. So it, all I have to do is just define uh, something to, somewhere to put the results, an execute method, which is basically taking what the uh, what what they need from Google Cloud, and a fetch all method. And, and all the main function is just been reduced down to these five or six lines. Hit the print. So finally, as my last show, let's run that. Run SQL pi, and hopefully, it should be exactly the same. There we go. So, SQL pi is out. Uh, I was trying to get version 0 0.3 in time for today. It sh I just need to update the docs. So wait till tomorrow. Hopefully, I've done it by tonight. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Huss. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes for questions, and as typically happens, it's always on the other side of the room. Um, can you have multiple queries per file? Because I just, I just. Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah. Access. Yeah. I didn't yeah. Really see that in the API. I could. Uh, basically, you can either pass a file with lots of queries in it, uh, just separated by new lines, and it can figure it out. It's all explained in the docs. They're very comprehensive. Or you can pass an array of different files so that if you want to keep them separate. So if you're using blueprints, it's nice to keep one query per blueprint, and then it, and then it globs them together, and then you have your object. So I'm still working on that, because kind of you have the whole query object for every blueprint, so maybe we should split it. So contributing is welcome. This is my first open source thing. I've been trying to get something open source for a while, trying to give back in some way, and this is my first attempt. Awesome. Thanks for the talk. Uh, could this work with something like async IO? Because with databases, performance is always key. We do use it in an async IO application, but we, it wasn't like, oh, let's specifically go and we just happened, I didn't even think about it. I just, oh, yeah, we have an async IO uh, process that runs and puts stuff in the database. So yeah, I guess it does work. <laughs> because the, all, of the connect, all of the connections kind of is done by, it's handled by the DB2 API. So all of the constraints about file IO are a matter with the uh, with the PsychoPG or C or MS SQL. Um, there's all of those different libraries. Basically. Any more questions? No. Well, thank you very oh, much for. Oh, well, one more. One more. So can you give us the uh, uh, your slide stack? Yes. So if you. At the bottom, so Hustech is where is what, what I'm on GitHub or uh, Twitter and stuff. So you'll find it there. Awesome, thank you very much, Huss. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs>